Thanks for pressing play. This is Christopher Lockhead, Follow Your Different. And we've been called the biggest box full of chocolates on the internet. And we aspire to have real conversations that celebrate the people, ideas, and companies that stand out. And man, do we have that today. Uh, We are sponsored by our friends at Oracle NetSuite. To learn how to turbocharge the growth of your business, check out netsuite.com slash different. And while you're there, you'll be able to set up a free one-hour growth review with an industry expert. Check out netsuite.com slash different. And are you feeling overwhelmed? Maybe it's time to look into the power of a virtual assistant. A virtual assistant is a very effective way to get back the most valuable thing in business and life, and that's time. Check out Bottleneck Virtual Assistants at bottleneck.online. All right. Um, This is kind of the second part of a two-part series. If you haven't heard episode 20 with David Cancel, a.k.a. DC, uh, I would encourage you to go do that. He's the founder and CEO of Drift, and they're a red-hot company. And on this episode, we have uh, Dave Gerhard, a.k.a. DG, and he's the head of marketing for Drift. And he's also a podcaster. He and DC... um, do one of my absolute favorite podcasts called Seeking Wisdom. And they're co-authors of a number one brand new best-selling book called Conversational Marketing, How the World's Fastest Growing Companies Use Chatbots to Generate Leads. Now, why did I want DG to come on? Um, These guys just pulled off what I think is a textbook, legendary uh, marketing lightning strike. And in this conversation, we unpack how Drift is designing a new category. We go deep on the strategies and tactics that Drift is using and how they executed this most legendary lightning strike centered around the new book. If you're a marketer, you're a CEO, you're an executive, um, even if you're a student, anyone who wants to do legendary marketing, there's a ton of gold in this episode. You'll gain practical insights into For example, how to get a massive amount of attention for your category, brand, and point of view. How to execute using an approach called the multiplier effect so that each component of your marketing mix multiplies the value of the other components. Um, How to make your company and your category undeniable. And how to do my favorite kind of marketing, which is legendary marketing that causes your competition to have emergency board meetings. (laughs) Go to lockhead.com. Check out the show notes and key takeaways for this episode and uh, some more on DG's background. Now, hey-ho, let's go. DG in the house, the nephew. (laughs) What's up, man? I love that you have two nicknames. DG and the nephew? Yeah. (laughs) And the best part is like my family, my wife, my friends, they don't don't like either of those. They're like, hi, Dave. (laughs) See, Dave, you know, Dave is like, look, no, no. As Archie Bunker would say, no intense offended. But Dave is like one of the top five most boring names you could have, right? Like <laughs> yeah, 100 guys named Dave. No, it is. It's, it's, that it's, we all know. It's cool. The, the hard part about a nickname is like you have, to get a, you have to get a nickname. I remember there was a – I played baseball with a kid in high school, and he was like, I want you guys to start calling me Brock. And we're like, I don't think a nickname works that way. You don't get to say what you want. <laughs> <laughs> you want the nickname to be so that's right they started dc so david cancels the ceo of drift uh, everybody calls him dc and has he been I, dc for a long time he's been dc for a long time um i think mainly because the, his name is actually pronounced david can't sell like i can sell but but uh people americanized his name and, and called it cancel and and so he just he goes by dc and 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 so everybody calls him dc when i and he's also david not dave and uh, when I joined Drift, you know, he, I was like the fifth or sixth, I don't know, 10th person here at the company. And like, I was like, I thought I was going to get David at Drift.com. I was like, I'm finally going to get a nice, simple email address. Yeah. And he's like, he's like, David at Drift.com is mine. So I gave you DG at Drift. And uh, that was kind of when everybody started calling me DG at Drift because my email is DG at Drift.com. So. And where did the nephew come from? So the nephew, the nephew and the uncle. So so DC refers to himself as the uncle. So he <laughs> so, gave himself that nickname. 
<laughs> I think he's he's playing on a couple of different things there. He's playing on the fact uh, that he's he's seen a couple of things, which is my way of calling him old. He's not old, but he'll give me shit anyway. Um, he's very good looking. He's very good looking. Very, very good, good looking. looking. Yeah, we all kind of have the same haircut. Um, and yeah, I love this haircut. I don't know about you, but I collect articles and people send me articles about two things. One, how much smarter, uh, how s- much sexier, how much women like men better with our hairdo. So I have a lot uh-huh. of those articles. I have a, a file of that. And the other one I have is um, people send me articles about how awesome swearing is. <laughs> those are the two big things I, I, I keep. I, I can I can uh, confirm both of those things. The best thing I ever did was 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 buzz my head. So it, so it's it's good. So um, also the the, ne- the 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 uncle thing is a it's a play on uh, you know the ne- the nephew is a term of is a term in, of endearment. I think there's yeah. only a couple there's only a couple people who get who get nephew status. Uh, there's somebody on the team who who's been amazing and and she did something amazing yesterday. And and DC said in Slack he was like. He's like, Sarah, congratulations. You've just earned niece in training status. <laughs> <laughs> so not full niece. No, no, not niece yet. in training. Because it takes time. You know, there's this you need you need you need some years in the in, in the game a little bit, but I but I think that uh, I think she'll eventually graduate to the niece status. So. Yeah. Now I, I gotta tell you, people have said to me that you are the new model CMO in the tech business, that you're the man. Mm. You're not the OG, but you're the new G. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that that's, I mean, that's, it's, sur- it's surreal to hear you say that because number one, I'm not a CMO. Um, one day it'd be great. Number two. What's um, your title then? If it's not CMO? VP, VP of marketing. Okay. Well, in it, as far as I'm concerned, particularly, I, I, so I don't know if you know, do you know much about martial arts? I, uh, no, I don't. Not, not at the level that I could have a conversation about it. So in the in in many martial arts, you have to take a belt test to get your next belt. Okay. But in jiu-jitsu, Br- Brazilian jiu-jitsu, and I, I'm not sure if it's the same for all jiu-jitsu, but for BJJ, um, there's no real – and it may be different in different parts of the world, but the guys that I know who are big-time BJJ guys around here, there's no belt tests. One day, your your master comes up to you and says – you're now a purple belt because you earned it. Yeah. Because, and, and, and you don't know when that's going to happen. And so here's what I have to say about CMO-ness for DG. I say that you just pulled off a fucking legendary lightning strike. And I want to unpack that with you. That's what I really want to get inside of. Because you, you did, I, I always like to say, DG, I like to do marketing that causes the competitors to have emergency board meetings and CEO firings. And you just pulled off a, a, a mofo of a lightning strike that is causing emergency board meetings at anybody who thinks they compete with you. I guarantee it. And they don't know what to fucking do right now. And so given that I say you're a CMO, that's what I have to say. And if you want, I'll talk to DC about it, but I think you just earned your CMO. In my world, you just earned your CMO stripes. You you just earned your CMO belt. Thank you, thank you. That 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 if if it's if that's the cri- to me honestly, that criteria to me sounds sounds more fun than than some of the things that would come with being a traditional CMO anyway. So I I, I would rather have that package that you described. Yeah. <laughs> so so hey, congratulations! I got I got. Wow! I got my conversational hold on, hold on, hold on. marketing hold it right here. Hold that up! I'm taking a screenshot. Right I'm taking here. a screenshot. Yeah, amazing, cool. And here's here's how awesome you guys are. You sent me one. Yeah. And the uncle sent me one. <laughs> and I think we, they we might have got here on the same fucking day. I don't know. I just love that you didn't coordinate it. You guys wanted to make sure <laughs> I got one, and it's fucking here. There it is. Conversational marketing. Oh and man. It's, and it's it's awesome. And so tell me about this lightning strike. Tell me about this book. Tell me about how you guys are designing this category and pulling off this. You guys are everywhere. You're all over all my social shit. Everybody's talking about you. They're writing articles about this shit. I mean, you guys just, you, you, you executed what we around here call the multiplier effect, like nobody's fucking business. So 
I'm going to, I want to shut up and have you tell me all about that stuff. So I can't, the, the, the stuff you said is amazing. And I, I, I just appreciate the, the, the chance to talk to you because I think about, about maybe almost two years ago, um, I got introduced to, to you through, through your book, which after Sequoia invested in Drift, um, Pat Grady sent a package to my desk and it was five copies of your book, Play Bigger. And he said, you need to read this. And I said, okay, if Pat Grady tells me to read a book, and I love marketing books anyway, but shit, I better read this book. So I read the book and the thing that blew me away was how much in the book that you guys talked about was like what we were already doing without ever talking about it. And, and I think one of the most powerful things I've learned about reading is that reading, like you don't... I, you don't often read to learn something new, but it kind of redef- like it clarifies something you're already working on. And so you guys really hit on this, this topic of like, we, we knew we were building a category, but we didn't really think about category design. And so that, that the lesson I took from the book and David and I talked a lot about this is category design. Um, long story short, two and a half years ago, I wrote the first book proposal for this. Uh, it was 2016. David sends me a note and he says, nephew, we need to write the book on this thing. And so, I found a publisher. I wrote a 10 page book proposal. It was the longest thing I've ever written in my life. All the papers that I wrote in school were like triple spaced for 10 pages. It wasn't actually real. Ultimately, they rejected the book proposal for a couple of different reasons. One of them was like, we hadn't even named this thing yet. And that was a real lesson for me. And like, if I can't tell the publisher what we call, we were like, you know, we're, we're using messaging, it's customer communication. They were like, uh. And so lesson number one is like, we had to name it. And it wasn't until we named it conversational marketing, whether the name is sexy or good or not, it doesn't matter, but you have to name it. And so the two things, number one, we didn't have a name. Number two, we had a little traction, but not enough. And so they said no, ultimately rejected the proposal. Last year, right around this time, January, February, I took another swing at the proposal. I said, hey, we've had some amazing momentum here. There's, there's over 100,000 businesses using Drift. You know, we have the top investors in, 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 the, in the investment world investing in us. We have all these testimonials, case studies, speaking opportunities. I had all the social proof. So I rewrote the proposal. They said yes. We had two and a half years of learning packed into the book, and we had a name for it. And so we sp- basically spent the last year writing the book and uh, launched it on, on January 30th. So it's been out for, for almost a month. It's a, a top 20 business book in the U.S. right now. Um, it's like in the top 1.5% of all books being sold on Amazon. It's number one in marketing, number one in sales. And so the, the response has just been, has been amazing. And uh, you know, it, it's, it's fun to be able to go out and now teach the world. And, and if you go and unpack all that stuff, you learn about category design, which is for us, in order for us to win, we need to elevate the category of conversational marketing and, and have that grow to be bigger than us. We want competitors in this space. We want more people in this space. We don't want conversational marketing to just think of drift, right? Just like you, you talk about in your book, you know, Apple and, uh, you know, Apple didn't, uh, Apple didn't invent the tablet, but they created a category that elevated the rest of the, of the world. Or the other example you give with, was, I think it was like jawbone headsets. They failed to create a category. So for us, everything we're doing is educating the market about conversational marketing. And hopefully that if we're the ones that teach you about it, then when you're ready to buy, you're going to come, come to us. It's a legendary POV strategy. It's a legendary thought leadership strategy. And here's the thing that you guys got that so few companies get. You're not having some nose picking fucking product discussion. You're not having some nose picking fucking feature discussion. You're having a strategic discussion I assume you'll tell me, but targeted at the CMO and senior level people in marketing and and, and mid to lower people, I'm sure. But you want, you tell me, but I assume you want the CMO to think, hey, fuck, we need a conversational marketing strategy and technology to go with that strategy. Is that what you're doing or tell me what you're doing? Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. It's both. It's like, it's the, it's the sell high and low strategy, which is like, you know, the CEO so what, one thing that, I, that we have is like the book is going to be at you know, every airport newsstand in the world uh, for three months, you know, starting soon. And the reason why is because I want the CEO getting off the plane to be like, I've heard about conversation marketing. Oh, shit. There's a book on it at the airport. 
okay, I better go check it out. And then what's this, what's the CEO going to do? Going to tell the marketing team, the marketing team's going to punt it down and say, somebody on my team better read this book and <laughs> get smart on it. And then when the person that does read the book, the second half of the book is very tactical and, and, and practical. And so it, it's literally like, do this here, say this thing now. And so we wanted to have the kind of the one, two punch of like, first half of the book is, is the why here's why, you know, the big, as Andy Raskin says, like tell the big undeniable change that's happening in the world. And then the second half is like, if you agree that this big undeniable change is happening, uh, here's the playbook for you to actually go back to your business. And, and it's literally a book where you could have, you know, dog eared and highlighted and scratched and written up because you, you're literally ripping pages out of it to actually go and implement on your website. So awesome. Now, the other thing it appears to me that you've done is you have used a, uh, how do I want to say this? Um, you've been very thoughtful about what components, what other components of the marketing mix to you. So the book is the lead component. It, it's the, it's the, um, the meat, it's the manifesto behind the POV that is conversational marketing. And, and you've got social and you've got PR and you've got your website and you've got, you've got your events that you're doing, but unpack for me the multiplier effect, the other, the things that you're doing around the book to make the category really go. There's, <laughs> so there's a lot. Do you, do you want me to talk specifically about, about like how we marketed the book or just how it's integrated into our whole business? Now? Both if you can. Talk about both. So Part of like, there's a great, I just, I'm obsessed with, with, uh, like copywriting and old school advertising. You books and I love and, David Ogilvy, um, right? See, Ogilvy is one. George Lewis. And, uh, George Lewis. Yeah. And the other one that I just read is Roy Williams, uh, the wizard mm. of ads. And, and in the wizard of ads book, Roy Williams has a quote from, from PT Barnum, the, the circus guy. That's all I know about him. Circus guy. And he has a quote and he says, nothing, he says, nothing, uh, nothing draws a crowd like a crowd. And so a huge part of like our strategy for, for marketing this book is to get it in the hands of as many people as possible, because you know, it's going to sell more books, more people having the book, right? It's like the only way is not, you know, everybody's got to have it on their phone and it's got to be on social and we got to have pictures of people reading the book everywhere. And so we've done a lot of things to basically, encourage people to tweet out and post pictures of the book because I want people to be like, God damn it. All I do is see this freaking book. Okay. I got to go buy it. Everybody's reading it. And, and marketers, especially we all have this, you know, keeping up with the Joneses kind of like mindset, which is like, wait a second, what, what are they, what my competitors, are, they're doing what? Okay. Where did they get that? Who's teaching them that? Okay. I got to do it. And so we're trying to like play into that, which is like, Hey, we're writing the new playbook. You got to go do it. And so it's been a lot about you know, one example is like, we spent a lot of time before the book launch, reaching out to uh, people who have, you know, sales and marketing podcasts and blogs. And we said, Hey, I don't even want you to buy the book. I'll give you a copy of it for free a month before that it comes out. Uh, because I want to come on your show and I want to talk about the book. And the only way it's going to be a good conversation is if you've actually read the book. And so I spent the last month just literally doing four, five, six podcast episodes a day, even interviews with people to try to spread the word as much as possible. And I don't care whether somebody has an audience of a hundred people or a hundred thousand people, because if you have a podcast about marketing and a hundred people that listen to it, damn, those a hundred people are like, who the hell are those hundred? Of course they yeah. love marketing. That's, that's a niche inside of a niche. And so, but by the um, way, I hate to interrupt you, but like, once we're done, um, yeah, we should spend a minute going through what you've been on and maybe some of the ones you want to go on. And if I can help make some introduction to some other podcasters and get you on some other podcasts, I'm happy to do that. Thank you, man. I seriously, uh, I will. I got to think of where we haven't gone. So yes. I'll but take isn't it that. interesting that today, uh, you know, in the old days, in the olden days or back in the day, as we say, you had to go do a book tour. Today, you don't yeah. do a book tour. You sit in your office or your house or wherever the fuck you are, yeah. your studio, and you do a book podcast yeah. tour, right? How many yeah, podcasts so, do you think really you'll be on to talk about conversational marketing in the next, you know, in the three months around the launch? A hundred, yeah. at least. At least. You know, I've already done about 40, so um, it's crazy. And, and uh, this is like the whole landscape has changed, right? Like, and I, I've been thinking about one of the pieces of marketing that I focus on at Drift is PR. And 
you know, PR has changed. Like PR, the power of PR has shifted from, it used to be the, the press, New York Times, Wall Street Journal. So everyone has a voice now and is a publisher. And so, and, and if anything, like a New York Times reporter isn't going to buy buy the book, but I might go on someone's podcast and that, that guy by day is the senior director of demand gen at whatever company that we're trying to sell to. And, and you, you get a two for one with that, where you just like did an interview and you educate this person about the problem that you're trying to solve. The other so, thing, I don't know if you find this and I, I don't want to be shitty, yeah. but, and I don't want to necessarily name names, but you know, I have written for many of the top tier business publications and, and a few news publications. Yeah. And I would write for, you know, a top brand. They would put the the post on the front of their homepage and leave it there for three or four days, sometimes a week. And there'd be a very minor increase to the visits to our website. But really, yeah. not much happened. And now I go and I do a post on Quora or a post on Medium or a post on LinkedIn or a post on fucking lockhead.com. And shit blows up. And I'm like, what the <laughs> fuck? And so I'm curious, like, I, I, and I don't have data around this, but I think a lot of those big name brands that that seem prestigious are not that fucking prestigious. And in, in, in so far as I, I don't know that anybody reads that shit anymore. Yeah, I, 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 I could, man, I could high five you or kiss you through this, this Zoom call right now because I, I couldn't agree more. And I've you are seen, a very handsome man. I've looked at, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I've, I've, I've seen it all, right? Like not, not, not I've seen it all, but like at Drift, for example, Drift has been in, we got a feature article in the New York times and I could, and then immediately the next day that that came out, I'm looking at Google analytics and I'm trying to see, and there was nothing because it's not, it's not direct response. And so you, you can't do PR to drive traffic now for social proof reasons, I can say that we were featured in the New York Times and, and somehow that will be, I don't know how you measure that, but yeah, it's definitely not a direct response channel. It's, it's great for awareness and the, the ego of, of getting the, the, the logo, but I, you know, I'm spending, I would say I'm spending 90, 90 plus percent of our time in PR on non-traditional PR channels, podcasts, videos, like I'll give you another example. A, a year ago, a year or two ago, we launched a, pro, a new product, and my whole strategy for launching the new product was going on YouTube and finding very niche uh, people who do product reviews on YouTube. I'm talking about people who have like, you know, two thousand vi- views on a video is good because those are the people that I wanted, right? Like Seth Godin calls them sneezers, where when they sneeze, everybody else gets sick, and they influence the market, and so. That that's an example. Like I'd rather find yeah. fifteen people who I know are like core in this market, and then I think you know we have the tools today to to make our own buzz. We don't need a reporter to write about us in order to get. Yeah, buzz. It, it really has changed in a very meaningful way, hasn't it, DG? And you you guys have yeah, really turned has. yourself into a, uh, a media company. Yeah, I mean, this is you know, all credit to to DC on this one. Like, this is the vision that he's had since the beginning, and also I think all the things that I get to do in marketing are because I work for a CEO and you, you know this, I'm sure you've, you've had bad experiences in in your career, but like marketing doesn't work unless the CEO is bought in, right? Like I don't get to go do a, all the things that you agree with because you're, you're, you're a marketer, right? You have a background, (laughs) you know what you're doing. The, none of that stuff where if I had to go justify, if I had a CEO who was like, why, why, why are you doing all these podcast interviews? How many sales are we getting from those? Right? Like, if I had to have those conversations, then it wouldn't work. And so 90% of my job works yeah. because I have, I work for, I work for two founders, David and Elias that, that really get marketing and care about it. And they're not questioning the value of why am I doing X or Y? Obviously, if we're going to go spend a hundred grand on AdWords, so that's different. And I better have a story around that and metrics around that. But for a lot of stuff with, with content and, and video and, and podcasts and, and PR, um, no doubt the thing that we're doing behind the scenes is, is building a media company. Well, and, and I think you just, you said a lot of things that were important there, uh, but start off with the support of DC. You know, uh, I did three tours of duty as a CMO, uh, all three public companies. In the first one, um, I had the support of the CEO for about 15 minutes. And, uh, and then after that, n- not so much. Um, and then in the second two, or in number two and number three, 
I had unwavering support from both CEOs. I could do virtually anything I wanted, you know, and there was some things you had to justify and, and so forth and so on. But I had very large spending limits, uh, you know, very healthy budgets. Um, and if I decided I wanted to fly somewhere and do, you know, whatever it was, I do pretty much whatever the fuck I wanted because A, the CEOs believed in marketing and, and B, probably more importantly, they believed in me. They saw the people that I brought in. And they were like, wow. And so we could do insane things. And, that you know, just like I'm sure, and I know it because I listen to your podcast, I hear you guys banging around about it. You know, sometimes, you know, a DC be like, what the fuck? You want to do what? And you're like, well, yeah, we're going to try this thing. And right. And so I think there's a, that's, that's something that um, maybe some CMOs uh, don't get how to do, which is the relationship with the CEO is the whole thing. Because if you have that, then you can do legendary shit. And if you don't, and if you have to justify it and have a business case and rah, 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 you're not going to get out of the fucking start gate. Totally agree. And, and I think a lot of people see like in that example, it's cool to hear your perspective because people will ask me like, Hey, DJ, I saw that thing that you guys, you guys did. How do I, how do I do that? I want to convince my boss. I'm like, I would go get another job. I, I'm, and I'm not, I'm like, I'm not trying to be a jerk. I'm not trying to be an asshole, but like, if you can't do those yes. things, go get a yes. different job. And, and I'm, yeah. But, but they, people want some answer. Like, okay, here's what I did. You, do you want my spreadsheet template? I can give it to you. Like <laughs> they, they want, they want a template or, or some trick, you know, but marketing only works if everybody's rowing in the same direction. So I'll give you one example, a crazy ish idea that we had for the book, which is I wanted people to, I wanted the book to be like larger than life on launch day. And so, uh, bought a, bought a billboard, bought the NASDAQ billboard in, in times square to launch the book. And that was one where there was no business case. The second I told David that he was like, okay, why haven't you done that already? And, and so we, we went there, we took a bunch of photos, we made a video, we, we, we tweet, you know, we invited customers and, and it just was a scene in times square where it was like, and, and, and even the team, like it, it fired up the 300 people at, at drift to see pictures from launch day with this like larger than life billboard of the book that we just spent two years writing and the category we created in Times Square just had this effect that we now have those pictures forever and that buzz forever where that's what we wanted out of that. Not, you know, I'm not going to have some, you know, end of the quarter business review where I got to justify the money that I spent to that to, to our C CFO and, and CEO. They, they and you also said something really powerful. There are some CMOs who maybe they would have the idea to do the, um, the NASDAQ uh, massive uh, billboard, but, listen to everything else you said. You got customers there. You took photos there. You put it on social media. I saw that shit. You had videos. You, you, so you are naturally intuitively, uh, using this execution device called the multiplier effect, right? So you don't just put the fucking billboard up in times square and maybe even take a picture of it. No, 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 no. You make an event out of the fact that you've been, and look, I, you know, I've talked to CEOs who are like, what's wrong with marketing people? Why do they celebrate an ad in the wall street journal? You just fucking paid for it. Who cares? You didn't earn it, but you know what? Let's go celebrate the times square ad. It's fucking cool. You know, a few years ago we were a small startup. We had hardly anything. We didn't have very much money. We had no fucking customers. It was a PowerPoint and a dream. And here we are launching a book and we got customers and we're super fast growing. And we got all this cool shit going on. Fuck it. We're going to go and we're going to celebrate. And to your point, you're going to use the multiplier effect to take, I don't yes. know what it costs to buy that thing, but you know, let's say I'll make it up. Let's say it costs a hundred grand to buy that thing. So for an incremental 30 or 40 grand on top of that, you take a hundred grand spend and make it feel like a million dollar spend, right? That's, that's the value of the multiplier effect. I, I, you just nailed everything, which is like, you're exactly, you're exactly right. The, the, the scarce minded CEO or CMO would think, it's just a billboard. What are we going to do? Where like we think of it as that's an anchor event to have all these other things happen, and 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 sure, I got I got a lot of hate, not a lot, but I got some, and you know, like like uh, I think I you you replied to a tweet that I said this morning where like sometimes you need the hate where people are like, oh look at look at this VC backed company just blowing their money on a on a billboard in Times Square, like what a waste, and 
that's one, like that's such an easy argument to make. That's such an easy story to say. Exactly. That's, that's, that's an easy story to say. Um, but I can think of like the hundreds, if not thousands of people who I know now were like touched by that and were like, man, I, I know for a fact that that thing helped sell books and make this launch feel a thousand times bigger than it was. And Maybe you know. Maybe that was a discussion in 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 a board in a boardroom some, somewhere else. Yeah. Well, uh, you know what my response to people say that is: go fuck yourself. That's why we raised venture capital. <laughs> right. It's like if I bootstrap this business by myself, I'm not buying a billboard no. in Times Square. And you're I not hiring you as many engineers, and you're not doing as many things on social media, and you're not doing as many podcast things. And you know the reason you hi- you you raise venture capital is to bend the growth curve up, right? And and what what's the what's the what's the stat in in, in your book like of the, you know, uh, I forget how you how you guys had it, but it's like of the company of the most successful companies in the last 20 years or whatever, you know, they're all category creators and they all raised some amount of money and all had big IPOs. Like all the yeah. ingredients are there. That's the field that we're that we want to play on, not, you know, not not I know I know for a fact David and Elias are not trying to well, that's beyond this point now, but they're not going to sell the company for, for 15 million bucks and, and be out, right? Right. So- As a matter of fact, there's something really weird in the data, a sort of fascinating, which was, um, and I don't have it in front of me, so, and it's been a couple scotches since we finished the book, but, um, but if my memory is right, DG, um, on average, the category kings, not only did they go public in that six to 10 window, what we ended up calling the 610 law, right? Six year, six to 10 years of age. All the category kings who create enduring value are in that age bracket. But we also looked at how much money they raised. And on average, they raised roughly 100 million before going public and roughly 100 million with the IPO. Um, and so there's also something weirdly magical, at least in the tech space, uh, and that's both consumer and enterprise, around so there's something about six to ten years and there's something about 200 million bucks that's kind of what it takes yep that's the that's the that's the path that we're on in the in the field that we're we're playing on for sure yeah. so totally fine if you if, if there were people that didn't like that we did that it's okay uh, yeah i you go yeah you go hate me for producing what in my opinion just watching you guys do it is no question, a legendary lightning strike to to turbocharge the category and to position drift as the category king. There are very few people who can pull off the kind of lightning strike that you guys just pulled off. I mean, I know. I, I even companies I've advised, and I if I had hair, I'd pull the fucking hair out trying to get them to do <laughs> a quarter of what you just pulled off. I don't know why. But they don't have the creativity. They don't have the courage. They don't have the execution ability. Um, they're, you know, some companies are very anal. And to your point, they're like, oh, well, you know, what's the ROI on the billboard in Times Square? And no, 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 whatever it is, right? Like back in the Mercury days, we did um, uh, our user conference. We called it Mercury World uh, one year at Caesar's Palace. And one of the folks on my team came to me and said, um, hey, do you know that while we're at Mercury World, uh, Elton John is playing at Caesar's Palace. And we were, you know, we were planning it at least a year ahead. And uh, and she said, hey, I've, I've looked into it and we could do a buyout of the theater uh, for a million bucks. And we'd be able to promote Elton John exclusive at Mercury World. Now, there is no fucking spreadsheet ROI calculator you can build that said <laughs> no. that makes that sound like it makes any fucking sense whatsoever <laughs> there's no there's no way to make no. those numbers work <laughs> but then when you go execute against it and you have an event that uh you make money on because your customers and your partners pay for all that shit and then when um you know elton's up there going i remember when rock was young and he says hey and he pulls the audience up and like you know, a hundred people from the front of the audience who are all VIP customers are up on stage dancing with Elton. Um, hey, they're gonna they're gonna <laughs> buy on. a lot of software. And they're still telling totally. people about that. No doubt, no doubt. Um, the, I'll give you another what one other funny story is. So 
you and I were off the record before this talking about hyper growth and, and, and it's a, it's a big expense for the company. Obviously anybody that knows events knows that you don't, you don't, you don't do an event like that uh, without spending a bunch of money, you know? And, and so it was after, so all summer, you know, every, every week we got the, the finance, the, the budget meeting with the finance team. Cause thank God they help us track the budget because you don't want me, you don't want me doing that uh, every day. And uh, so we're looking at the hyper growth budget. It's expensive. We know it, whatever. We had, we had about 5,000 people in Boston. Uh, you, you were out in San Francisco. We had in Boston, we did a month earlier. We had 5,000 people there roughly. And after the event, it was an amazing day. After the event, this guy, uh, one of our, one of our, finan- our head finance guy, he comes up to me and this guy, he never shows any emotion. I don't think I've ever heard him in his voice raise or, or curse or anything. He comes up to me and he, uh, he might've had a beer or two. He gives me this bear hang and he goes, DG, I fucking love you. That was unbelievable. You can have all the money that you want. And I was like, this, see, that is the thing like that you cannot quantify is you have to feel it. And so that day among thousands of people who are there to support drift and our, our, our friends and family and customers and, and investors and advisors and, and future customers, like you have to be there to feel it. And so if you were there in Times Square, you felt it. If you're at Drift that day when we launched a book, you felt it. If you're at Hypergrowth, you felt it. And so I think so much of marketing is, unfortunately, this is the, the bad part about marketing technology is it kind of took the creativity out of marketing, yeah. right? Like Because people you know, think it's all about SEO ago, Mark- and shit that's measurable it's all about every every everything's a funnel where where like marketing went from marketing used to get shit on because it was like oh that's arts and that's the arts and crafts team then we had this other shift which is like it's highly quantifiable everything can be measured and so like the pendulum swung completely in the other direction where i think the best marketers are the ones that can do both and i actually think that creativity today is the most this, this is going to sound funny to you, right? You've been th- CMO three times, pu- three public companies. But like today, the marketer, the, the majority of the marketers that I see, the biggest skill that they're lacking is not spreadsheets or tracking or funnels. It's creativity. And I think we have to you know, do our part to like, I, I, I want people to, I want to leave Drift one day and have people think, man, that was the most creative marketing team that I ever, I ever knew that that's what I want. Like my legacy here to be. Amen. Hallelujah. I got an email a little while ago from a, a younger marketer in Brazil who was working at a marketing agency. And this was exactly his concern that they were so analytical measuring everything. And look, don't get me wrong. I think it's awesome that digital marketing technology allows us to measure shit in ways that we could never even dream of in the past. And that's super cool. But I couldn't agree with you more. The more true that is, the more value, super creative, super innovative stuff. And here's the other thing nobody gets. They say, okay, I say to them, hey, um, what, what, what is it that makes somebody Google something? Right, because they want to capture the leads. Right. They want to, it's all about the funnel to your point. Like, okay. So something has to happen before somebody types in drift or conversational marketing or chat bots or fucking whatever. Right. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. People don't just wake up in it from a dream and, 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 and just go yeah, Google and drift. So what I explain to CEOs and CMOs all the time is, Hey, listen, um, uh, cause I see a lot of them where they've tilted the marketing budgets extraordinarily to your point like I, I say what percentage of the budget is on lead gen is on the website is on the measurable stuff the analytical stuff and you know sometimes i hear 50 60 70 percent i'm like okay um what how do you get somebody to go to the website how do you get somebody to type in uh drift or conversational marketing or whatever it like something has to happen first and that's frankly, that's all the soft stuff. That's the creative stuff. That's the innovative stuff to make it become um, a, a category that starts to tip. And then once people are interested in it, then you want to capture that interest. But what is it that creates the interest? It's all the creative shit that you guys are doing so incredibly. Hey, I think to me, it's got to be uh, marketing like everybody has a podcast, everybody has a blog, everybody's doing video, everybody's on social media, everybody knows all the tricks for SEO, everybody knows all the tricks for paid marketing. And so those are kind of all like in this bucket that's become table stakes. And so I think the thing that I just think about, this is like David has just 
beat this into my head is like we have to, in a world where everybody's going left, we have to go right. Just because that's the only way that we're going to get somebody's attention. Also, the other thing is, what is every sales, what is every sales rep or marketing person in the world going to tell you? They're going to say, hey, the thing that, I'm, the thing that we do, it's better, it's faster, it's easier to use, it integrates with all the... T- like, and so even if that is true, people don't believe you. I'm, I'm more skeptical than ever as a buyer, like in my personal life, right? My, my wife and I just bought a new car. I got to listen to all the shit that the, the sales guy's telling me. And I'm like, I don't believe half of it, right? Even if it's true, even if it's the best car in the world, I don't believe it. And so as a marketing team and, and marketing people, we have to think about how are we going to separate ourselves? So the example that I always use is marketers do this all the time where if you and I on this podcast, we said that the best time we did a study and we found that the best time to send an email is at Tuesday, Tuesday at 2.07 PM. 99% of marketers are going to go send an email at at that time where I want to be the guy that's, that's sending you an email Saturday night because nobody's marketing to you on Saturday night. And so we're always trying totally. to think of like ways we can kind of totally. The crowd. I remember very, very early in my career, I was working with this legendary sales guy and he did this was, you know, hardcore cold calling out of the fucking yellow pages shit. And uh, we were out having beers once, you know, I was in my early 20s and he says to me, you know, my favorite time to cold call Friday afternoon. And I said, what? He goes, yeah, because you know who's in the office Friday afternoon? The CEO, the owner, the, the, the senior executive. And, and, you know, this was back, you know, uh, in the old days, right? So people actually picked up phones and shit, right? Yeah, be unconventional. If they're going to zig, we're going to fucking go kabang. <laughs> and it's just, it just a, it's a game. It, marketing today is like a war. It's a war for attention, right? It's easier, it's easier to reach people today. Like I think of just, I'm just, use myself as an example. Like I am, uh, I got work. I got, uh, my wife is pregnant. We, we have one, we have a toddler. We have another kid on the way. Uh, I'm busy at work all day. I go to the gym. I read stuff at night. I do stuff in the morning. I see my family. Like there's only so much time. And so the only way that like how, why, nobody wants to be marketed to. And so I'm just, what is going to stop somebody in their tracks, in their Instagram feed, in their LinkedIn feed, in their inbox, in, in person and get them to be like, huh, drift. Okay. I'll remember that for next time. It's all about like, how can you get somebody to stop yep. them in their track? Now, I know I don't have you for much longer. You and I could talk marketing together together forever. I would like to have you back. Oh. Uh, anything you want to touch on before we wrap, DG? No, I just was going to say, I, I, I wish, wish I was looking at my heart rate during this interview because it is that much fun talking to you. And, and uh, I, I just think, look, I think, I think you just got to be, the only thing I want to leave with is this like, don't be afraid to take chances in marketing. And I think, I think that's the, I think it's really easy to stay inside of this yes. comfort zone. Like we, we run, we run webinars, we do meetups, we do a podcast, but like, what is the thing, what, what thing are you going to do in, in Q2 or, or next month that that's going to be like, that has a chance you might fail. Right. But in order to become like a legend, like you always say, right. In order to become a legend, you have to, you have to risk being yes. a loser. And so you have to swing and miss in order to figure out and, and go, go back look at all those, look at Ogilvy, right? Ogilvy out of the best part about Ogilvy is like the only campaign, you only saw the good campaigns from him, right? That guy probably had to come up with a hundred shitty ideas to have right. one good one. And I think you have to do the same thing in marketer. Like I have bad ideas <laughs> all the time. Most of my ideas, most of my ideas, I send them to David and he's like, try again, buddy. Right. And, but, but it's the one out of every 10 that, that you, that you get a lightning strike. And so, so don't be afraid to take chances, think of some crazy stuff, but also be curious. Like you got to marketing to me is not B2B marketing. I, I observe everything now through a marketing lens. I could be getting my coffee and I'm looking at, why do they have the menu like that? Why do they have the sign like that? I could be looking over my, my wife's shoulder while she's on her phone on the couch at night, figuring out why does she follow that person on YouTube? Really? That person has 10 million followers on YouTube. They're, they're writing about eyeshadow. This is crazy. What did they know about marketing that I know? It's just this like constant curiosity that, that, that keeps me going. Well, and that's why you're the new G. Ooh, I like that. The right. There's G. the OG, <laughs> right? So DC's the OG. OG. You're the new G. Yeah. So now you have a third <laughs> nickname. I dig it. We'll have to send oh, you one it. of these. This is, uh, this is from my... Hey, this is what you, when you do, when you do non-conventional things, this is what you get. I met up with a customer and they're like, I met, I was in San Diego. 
or where the, where the San Jose. And this guy's like, can you bring this to DC? <laughs> Is that I normal? Love I love that you have a DC bobblehead. I got to get one. I just got to, I'm going to put it right here on my fucking cool <laughs> desk right next to my scotch. <laughs> All right, DG. All right, man. Thank you for having Thank me. Thank you. On. You're awesome. I'll Congratulations on a legendary lightning strike around the book and the category. And it's fucking awesome. I love to see what you guys are doing. I'm a massive, massive fan. Uh, namaste. You. I'm I'm coming your way soon. I'm going to send you a note. I would love to actually. Hey, man, you, you, so. I would love to have you here. Uh, we can do it. We can do a in-person episode, a follow up episode. We can, uh, you know, uh, consume some libations, enjoy the beach, um, <laughs> maybe have a nice meal. Yeah. Talk more marketing and lightning Whatever strikes and category design and kicking competitors asses and all the good shit. Love it. All right, man. Thank you for everything. Seriously, you're the best. All the support is amazing. Thank you, brother. You guys are awesome. Huge fan. Bye-bye. DG on the podcast, or I should say the oddcast. Uh, I sure hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. And if you haven't gone back and listened to episode 20 with uh, David Cancel of Drift, I highly encourage you to do that as well. Uh, now, it's got to be time to grow beyond the status quo. Leaders, business leaders, business executives, managers get paid to drive growth. And you can't drive growth unless you have the platform to power the growth. And that platform, my friends, is NetSuite. NetSuite is the number one cloud ERP system. Uh, they are, if you will, the category king. And they provide a unified business management platform for entrepreneurial businesses that will scale with you from the garage to the IPO and beyond, encompassing ERP, financials, CRM, e-commerce, and more. As a matter of fact, their e-commerce capability allows you to connect your order management and your inventory to your website seamlessly so you can sell online or sell on uh, mobile platforms. So I want you to go check out netsuite.com slash different. And while you're there, you will be able to set up a free one-hour growth review with an expert in your industry. And uh, NetSuite is uh, surprisingly cost-effective, more cost-effective than you might think. NetSuite.com slash different. All right. We would like to thank the new book by uh, our friend and today's guest, DG, Conversational Marketing, How the World's Fastest Growing Companies Use Chatbots to Generate Leads. Also, um, I would highly encourage you to check out his podcast, Seeking Wisdom. I love this podcast. I subscribe to it. It's a riot. It's fun. I always learn stuff. It's awesome. Seeking Wisdom. Harper Collins, Instant Classic, Play Bigger, How Pirates, Dreamers, and Innovators Create and Dominate Markets. Uh, my good friends at OneLifeFullyLive.org. This is the nonprofit helping you dream, plan, and live your best life. The number one, LifeFullyLive.org. The uh, amazing folks and official coffee of this oddcast, Verve Coffee Roasters at vervecoffee.com and in Santa Cruz, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and Tokyo, vervecoffee.com. Dushka Zapata's best selling book, and this one has an awesome name. Actually, they all do, but I love this one a little extra special. It's called Someone Destroyed My Rocket Ship, and it's got the best subtitle. Uh, you can imagine the subtitle is and other havoc I have witnessed at the office. <laughs> Someone destroyed my rocket ship by Dushka. Um, another podcast I love culture eats strategy by my friend, uh, Jamie J who's been called the nicest man in podcasting. And he's also the producer of this podcast. Does your organization want to drive positive change? Why not check out flourishing leadership Institute at lead to flourish.com. And um, entrepreneurs are always looking for hot new information, uh, cool new stuff to check out. Why not check out growwire.com, what legendary entrepreneurial people are reading. And there's a YouTube channel. There's an awesome podcast that I've been lucky enough to be a guest on. Check out growwire.com. Now, uh, we apparently have a lot of listeners in Australia. Love getting email from you folks. I've always loved visiting there. And if you want to do some legendary marketing in Australia, why not check out my buddy Vaughn O'Connor's business, Rapid Media, legendary marketing, media, and communications in Australia at rapidmedia.com.au. And uh, speaking of legendary marketing outside the U.S., my friends at Fusion, 
PR, marketing, and graphic design in the beautiful country of Ireland. Check out Fusion, F-U-Z, or Z, depending on how you want to go, I-O-N, that's F-U-Z-I-O-N dot I-E. And the fantastic people at the World Wildlife Foundation, WWF dot O-R-G. Because we only have one planet, and look, if you're like me, you love animals. And uh, thousands of species of animals are being threatened right now on our planet. And I think we need to stand up and do something about it. Check out www.org and do what I do. Make a donation. Thank you so much. All right. I need to remind you that uh, today's information is provided to you solely for informational purposes. And you should consult your clergy, uh, your lawyer, your spiritual spiritual advisor, spiritual advisor, spiritual advisor, shaman, and anyone else you want to uh, get some advice from before taking action on it anything you heard today. <laughs> this podcast is the sole property of the Lockhead Oddcast Network. All rights do remain disturbed. Not, re- not recommended for fans of Grant Cardone. Mm-mm-mm. Be nice to your uh, local CMO. Support your local entrepreneurs. Don't forget to buy John's Crazy Socks, the official sock provider to this Oddcast. Uh, and why not be a, 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 a podcast hero? Tell two people you love about two podcasts you love. And if you're an iPhone, iOS user, and you have Siri enabled, um, here's a fun party trick. Uh, Next time you're around somebody you like, get a hold of their iPhone and uh, say, Siri, subscribe to Christopher Lockhead, follow your different. And she'll go do that for you. How cool is that? Uh, Beware of pre-I in the passing lane. Please get over. Uh, Listen to Leonard Cohen. Only buy pasture-raised, free-range eggs. Thank you, Candy Dandy. I love you, Mom and Dad, and hey, Colin. This odd cast really ties the room together, doesn't it? Today, our deepest apologies go out to Richard Kelly, chairman of PG&E. Sorry, Dickie, we just ran out of time for you. All right, that's it. Uh, I want you to know I really appreciate you investing part of your life with me. It means the world to me. And until next time, follow your different.